This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. There are so many things for which we may be thankful. And today I want to thank uh, Tom Dooling and Jay Ha and our choir for the beautiful music they've provided and also our handbell choir for, for that great gift. There are just so many ways that, that we are blessed in this church and, and sometimes it's just hard to, to know how to express that. So, so to you all, Tom, Jay, choir, thank you so much. The handbell choir, thank you so much. What a blessing. And, and happy Thanksgiving in case I don't see uh, any of you all before Thanksgiving. I hope to see some of you at the service on Wednesday. But, but just in case, I want to say again, happy Thanksgiving. And thank you for the many blessings that you've poured out to me, to my family, uh, to all of the Fullers as we have been here. I've had my my parents were in town last weekend. Morgan's parents were here the weekend before that. And I tell you, they feel like real celebrities. They feel like real VIPs whenever they come into this church. And it is, it's just great to, to feel your welcoming spirit extended to them. So again, put that in another, another file. Uh, I'm, just, I'm realizing how far behind I am just in, in thank you notes and thanksgivings for all the things that you all pour out on us. I think that Thanksgiving is such an important theme in scripture, in scripture, and that's one of the reasons that Psalm 107 has become particularly important to me. If you turn with me to Psalm 107, if you, if you have it in your Bible, if you've got your Bible with you, turn there, but it's also printed in your bulletin. And hear now these words from the psalmist from Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by the straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Let us pray. O oh Lord, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. As we come together in thanksgiving today, we ask that you would open our hearts, that you would open our minds and that you would encourage us to think beyond just the receiving of gifts, but to the use of those gifts for your purposes. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. For it is in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Now, you all may have seen this many times, but... I wanted to mention something that happened in this service last week. Last week, our, our precious member, Lindsay Givler, who is a regular usher in one of our usher teams, and I'm sure she's here. Lindsay, could you raise your hand? Can you stand up for just a second? Everybody wave. Lindsay, thank you. You all know Lindsay. One of the things I always tell people is if you, if you have met Lindsay, you know Lindsay. And if you don't know Lindsay, then you haven't met Lindsay because she is one of the kindest, most enthusiastic, encouraging people that you will ever meet. Thank you, Lindsay. You can have a seat. Um, but I wanted to mention something that happened last week, and it happened again today. And last week, it was particularly powerful for me, given what had happened down in Sutherland Springs. But you may remember the last week, and you saw it again today, that, that Lindsay helped take up the offering. And after the offering was received and she and the, uh, and the other ushers brought it forward. She came, she placed it in the alcove. And then as we were singing the, the doxology, that song of glory and praise and thanksgiving to God, she just raised her hands, especially last week, was particularly enthusiastic, raised her hands up like this, like we had just scored a touchdown. And it was awesome. It was just, it, it, was, it was not just a touchdown. It was also sort of her hands made that, that V for victory sort of sign. And it was a reminder to me that, that we are victorious, that we are blessed. And, and what was really cool about that was that it happened during the offering, because I can't remember the last time as a pastor, after we took up the offering, people started high-fiving and whooping and things like that. <laughs> it, just, it just doesn't happen that often. But it was great to see Lindsay's enthusiasm, and it started to make me think about this. You know, here we are, but 
you know, as we ha- head into the Thanksgiving holiday, you know, I've thought about Lindsay a lot this week. I've thought about the offering a lot this week. I've thought about giving thanks this week. And I, and I started to ask myself, what's the connection between worship and offering, between thanksgiving and giving, and how does that all tie together into the mission that God has set before us? What's the connection between thanksgiving and giving and worship and mission? Well, that's why I keep going back to Psalm 107, because it is such a priceless psalm for us, especially as we think about the ways that God has blessed us. Let's take a deep look at Psalm 107 for a second. As we look at this psalm, several things should jump out at us. The first is that this psalm begins by giving all glory and thanks to God, and it's full of gratitude throughout. The first line says, O thanks, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. From the beginning, this psalm begins with thanksgiving. From the beginning, our relationship with God is not based on achievement. It's not based on getting it right. It's based on thanksgiving for what God has done for us. What a great place. What a great way to start a relationship with someone, to start a relationship with God. From the very beginning, this psalm acknowledges that God loves us and that God gives to us. Our God is a giving God. And when it says that his steadfast love endures forever, that's, our, that's the Bible's way of telling us that our God is not cheap. Our God is not stingy. Our God is not sparing or scarce. He's not operating from that kind of mindset. He loves to give us to us generously. Our God is lavish. Our God is gracious. And most of all, our God is a loving God who loves to give to us. And then we come to that line that, in my opinion, ignites this passage. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. In other words, if if you've been blessed by God, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. That verse is so full of meaning. First of all, it says, let the redeemed, underlie the word redeemed, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. The redeemed are those people that God has saved and blessed and the psalm gives several examples of those types of people in verse 4 it talks about people who are in economic crisis the poor the hungry the homeless but really all of us have been through economic crises at some point or another it talks in verse 10 about those that god has saved from a life of crime if you've ever done prison ministry you know how transforming god can be And the lives of those people who are going down the dark path and are now on a path to him and a path with him. Verse 17 says that God has saved people from rebellion and from self-destructive lives and lifestyles. People who are living apart from God and who are being destroyed by their sin and depravity and perversity. Do you know anybody who's in any kind of recovery program? Somebody whose life has been changed because they finally acknowledge that God is more important and their addiction or something like that. And then there's this fourth group, and this one's, this one's a little bit more challenging to understand. David describes this group as a people on the sea being tossed and thrown in the tumult and the waves. And remember that the Bible uses the sea, uses the ocean as a metaphor for chaos. In the beginning, when the world was formless and void, the tohu vavohu was sort of pictured as this tumult of the sea. Yeah, I've, I've always loved water. I love going to the beach. I love sailing. I love boating, things like that. But, you know, so I've always had an affection for the sea, for, for big bodies of water. But, but remember, the Hebrews, they were a desert people. To them, it was scary. Bad things came from the sea. The Philistines came from the sea. Storms came from the sea. All these things came from the sea. And in the Bible, the sea has come to represent those unexplainable, unforeseen, chaotic, seemingly meaningless tragedies in our lives. Maybe it's something like the chaos unleashed in Sutherland Springs a couple of weeks ago. Maybe it's the death of a child or the unexpected death of a friend or of a parent. Maybe it's a cancer diagnosis that you know is going to throw you up and down like the waves of the sea. Maybe it's some act of violence, a murder or a rape. 
the death of a spouse. It's the kind of chaos that makes you freeze in your tracks, that paralyzes you and makes you ask, God, what's going on? Why is this happening? But basically, this psalm is saying that God delivers all kinds of people from criminals to sinners to the poor to the overwhelmed. God has saved people from their circumstances. God is strengthening them in their circumstances. And in each case, God has blessed them with his love. And what I love about this psalm is that all of us fit in somewhere. What unites the people of David's age, of the, of the age of the Psalms, and us, is that all of us have been saved by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Because maybe you've never been a prisoner in chains. Maybe you've never been homeless or destitute. Maybe you've never been in one of those sort of circumstances. Maybe you've never been the victim of a violent or tragic event. But we are all under the judgment of God. We are all separated from God don't make me say it again. If we say that we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. As a matter of fact, the scripture says that if we say that we have no sin, then we are calling God a liar. But Paul says we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And yet he has still given himself. He has still saved us. Taking his uh, taking our sins and his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. But what really connects us to the people of David's time, to the people mentioned in this psalm, is that there's a special characteristic of the people of God. What unites the redeemed person of David's age and the redeemed person of our age is that in each case, the people of God when they're in trouble, turn to the Lord. David says they cried to the Lord in their trouble. The people of God are not the people who have it all fixed and figured out. The people are, of God are the ones who turn to the, to the Lord and they say, this is too big for me. This is too violent for me. This is too confusing for me. Oh God, I need your help. I cannot do this on my own. They're the people who acknowledge God's authority and they acknowledge God's power to make a difference and they acknowledge his love for us that will not abandon us or let us go as tragic or as dark as things seem to become. And so the problems, as we see in this psalm, the, the problems outlined in this psalm are not petty problems. They are big, they are deep problems. And so the corresponding gratitude that goes with these problems, well, that's a deeper kind of gratitude. This is not the kind of gratitude you have when somebody gives you a nice birthday present, they give you a gift card from Barnes & Noble or something like that. This is the kind of gratitude that you have for somebody who pulls you out of the way of a speeding bus or a doctor who performs a life-saving surgery on you, or that friend who did not abandon you when everybody else was fleeing from your presence. It's that kind of gratitude. It's the kind of gratitude that comes when we cry to the Lord. He heard our trouble and he delivered us. When we realize that we've been saved. Gratitude really begins in the life of a Christian when our eyes are fully opened and we re when we realized that God has not just blessed us with good things. He has saved our lives. He has saved us from all that stuff that we don't want to talk about in church because it might make people uncomfortable. He has saved us by the blood of his son and by his resurrection. And we owe him everything. And finally, as we continue to look at this psalm, there's one more line I don't want you to miss because it's key, it's the key for connecting thanksgiving and giving. Verse 32 says, let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. This psalm is not just about giving thanks to God for all that he's done in our lives. This psalm is about going public with our thanksgiving. It's about going public with our praise and getting serious about our action. 
The psalm says, I will praise him, I will thank him, and I will do it all in front of people. I'm going to do it in front of God and everybody. This shows that that what God has done for me is more important than my pride. It's more important than peer pressure. It's more important than all of those things that make us hold back, that, that keep us from throwing up our hands and the touchdown. I will extol him. I will go public in the assembly of the elders. I will show how great is his love for me. So how do we connect all of these things together? Worship and offering and thanksgiving and giving. Well, it's simply this. Giving is thanksgiving put in action. Giving is thanksgiving put in action. In other words, giving converts our faith into reality. I know all of you have a a cookbook in your house or some recipe somewhere. Well, guess what? A recipe is just an idea until you start mixing up eggs and flour and water and spices or whatever it is to make the recipe into a reality. A building plan is just a plan. It just scratches on a piece of paper until you start digging the foundation, until you start laying the stones, until you start pulling wires and doing all of those sorts of things. And you know what? Faith is just an an idea. It's just a mood until you start putting that knowledge together with the real substance of life. It's when our faith goes public. I want to make sure we understand this that giving is not something we do to earn God's grace. Giving is something we do to illustrate God's grace. Again, I want you to think about Lindsay with her hands up in a big V. We're already declaring victory because we're not walking toward the cross. We're walking from the cross. We're not walking to victory. We're walking from victory because he has already won the battle. And the work of the church, the mission of the kingdom of God happens, that is to say, Jesus is made visible when our thanksgiving becomes giving. What I mean is that giving forces our spiritual experience out of our minds and out of our hearts, out of our mouths, and out and into our hands. Really? Faith, as I said, is just a mood until we find, until we feel, that is to say, till we feel God's presence, not only in our hearts, not only in our minds, but in our bank accounts and in our schedules. The book of Proverbs says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. You know, there's another translation I actually like better. Honor the Lord with your substance. I mean, with your wealth, yes, but not just your wealth, with your time, with your influence, with your heart and your hands, not just by writing a check or by swiping a card, but face to face face-to-face with homebound members, face-to-face with with our homeless neighbors, face-to-face with our children, with our middle schoolers, with our high schoolers, face-to-face with our college students and with our singles and those who are newly married and young adults and new parents, face-to-face with those whose lives are darkened by the storms of chaos and events that are too big and powerful for them to manage on their own. And what Solomon says in Proverbs is this, give the best of what you have, not just the rest of what you have. The power of the kingdom of God is the power of Jesus Christ in the believing heart, overflowing with gratitude and love for God. It's when a real believer tells the real truth, shares the real love of Jesus Christ with real people in need. And that could happen ringing bells or leading worship or building habitat houses or raising money for families in Sutherland Springs or feeding the homeless or building in Mexico, clearing moldy furniture and hurricane debris in Rockport. The power of God shows up when our thanksgiving becomes giving. Here's something else that that caught me. 
In 2 Thessalonians, Paul wrote this. He says, We ought to always give thanks to God for you, brothers, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Now, like many of you, my family has a holiday tradition. At the Thanksgiving table, we all go around and we, we say something for which we are thankful. Well, I want to do that right now. Not, not with all of us, just I'm going to do it. Um, I'm really thankful because as a pastor over the last 14, 15 months, I have seen how God is, is working in your hearts, how, it's, how he's working in this community, how he is giving you a love for his word, how he's giving you a love for prayer, how he's giving you a love for one another. And it just makes me rejoice. You know, it, it just, it's contagious. It makes me feel thankful. You know, a good friend of mine who's a pastor, he, he always says to his congregation, you know, what? I love you all and I even like most of you. But here's the thing. God is doing that. He is healing this congregation. He is is focusing this congregation with friendship, with fellowship, with commitment to his word and prayer. And you know what? I, I would hazard a guess that you don't know the name of every person in this room, but you see them, and maybe they said a couple of views in front of you, and you see them week after week, and you know that person's name. You may not know the person down the road, but if that person were to disappear tomorrow, if that person were to to just go away, you would miss that person. You would miss these people. Never take that for granted. But you know what? Even as I see your faith grow, the more I see it grow, the more I see you investing in other people. The vision for this church is turning outward again. And people are excited to think about ways that we can can use the blessings God has given us to influence this city. And so I give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Thanksgiving isn't just an option. It's not just something we do because we're grateful. Thanksgiving is both a blessing and a responsibility for those whom God has saved, for those whom God has redeemed. Because those problems that David has mentioned, well, they're still with us today, aren't they? There's still people in political in, in economic crisis. There are still people in personal crisis. There are still people in emotional crisis. There are still people in psychological crisis. You know, we, we think that you know, if we just turn to, to Washington or we just turn to Austin or we just turn to City Hall, they'll fix those problems. But you know what? Our worst problems, they're not political. They're not economic. They're not even social. Our worst problems are spiritual because they are the underlying component to all the rest of it. The biggest problems we have are spiritual. Think about it. Divorce, bad marriages, abuse, that's a spiritual problem. Poverty is a spiritual problem. Racism is a spiritual problem. Yes, they all have symptoms in these other areas. But what if we could could address the spiritual issues at the root of so many of those things? Well, you know what? That's what we're called to do. As the redeemed of the Lord, we have the responsibility to connect those with problems to the to the one who can, who can address their problems at a deeper level than we could ever hope to imagine. As a matter of fact, the church, this church, your church, represents the only institution on this planet, in the universe, that has been charged with connecting people to Jesus Christ. Because then Jesus Christ will connect them to eternity and the power of God. Nobody's going to do it if we don't do it. If the church does not step up to this, if we do not declare the Lord in the presence of the congregation and the assembly of the elders, if we don't go public with the faith we've received, then we've missed not only our duty, but our opportunity. So here's the truth of it. First Presbyterian Church is a bridge It's a bridge that connects people to Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ connects people to eternity. And this is a bridge that is built on timbers of gratitude. I want you to think about it for a moment. Think about the people who cared about you enough to invest in your life. Sunday school teachers, youth advisors, friends, maybe somebody who just brought something to your house. Think about about the, the fellowship that you've enjoyed. Think about the things you've learned. 
Think about the number, the millions of calories you've consumed over in Westminster Hall. (laughs) Think about the important moments that you've shared, weddings, funerals, baptisms, confirmation. Look around the room. Put a name to those blessings. Think about how God has given you something, a precious gift that you can share. How many late night conversations have you enjoyed? How many gestures of love extended? What prayers have been prayed for you? I'm not ashamed at all to ask you to take that thanksgiving and make it giving. If what this church has done for you is important in your life and in the life of the people, the lives of the people you love, then let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You've all received, if you're a member of this church, you've received a brochure talking about our needs for next year and how we can keep the ministry of this church moving forward in a very positive direction. We don't want you to give out of duty. We don't want you to make a commitment because you feel like you have to. I just want you to start counting your blessings. I want you to pray about it. And then I want the Lord to move the pen. You know, I decided many years ago to go off of the advice of Charles Stanley, great Baptist preacher from Atlanta. He said, you know what, I'm not going to harass you about giving. I'm not going to harass you about, uh, about pledging or anything like that. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to pray to God, and he's going to harass you. <laughs> I hope that he continues to harass you with blessings incalculable. And if he has already and let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let them declare it in the assembly of the faithful and in the congregation of the elders. Let's pray.